Welcome everybody to Holy Trinity Church, West Bromwich. I am Neil Robbie, the vicar, and this is the service for the 23rd of April, a true heart and clear mission. It's only been two weeks since Easter, and one of the things we were challenged about before Easter, remember when Gillis came and spoke, was how quickly we would forget without regular reminders. And so in, in one sense, our service today is a regular reminder of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his love for the world, and especially for his people. So as we prepare to rejoice in him this morning, we have a call and response to begin to prepare our hearts. Um, we'll start seated and then when I say, the set, start the second bit, when I say, we stand up and praise you, let's stand up and praise him. And we'll go straight into the first song. Come and stand before your maker full of wonder, full of awe. So let's prepare for worship. I'll say the words in light print. We join together in the words in bold. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Amen. We stand up and praise you, Lord our God, for you are eternal. Blessed be your glorious name, exalted above all honour and praise. Let's rejoice with our instruments, give it a shake.
you are to the object of our eye, our hearts can rejoice. Whatever our situation is today, whatever sickness or sorrow, Lord, we thank you that you carry that up the hill. In your name we pray. Amen. Do take a seat, everybody. Um, we're going to pray together. The collect for the second Sunday after Easter, which is a prayer that we prayed in many Church of England churches today. And so we pray, Almighty God, who gave your only Son for us to be both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly life, give us the grace that we may receive with thankfulness the immeasurable benefit of his sacrifice and try day by day to follow in the steps of his most holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now our, our remembering his sacrifice and then following in his ways is what we are about. And before the children and young people go out, Jackie and Amanda and Ruth, we're going to Think about what you have learned so far in the service of the series, Who Am I? Can I remember? No. No, I'm going to ask Isaac if he might ask another. Remember the first, the first week? What was the symbols? What was the actions? Remember? I am precious. I am so long since I've done it, you've got some. Can I remember the headlines? I completely forgot it. Anybody? Helen can do it. Where are the notes? Here, look. I'm made by God and precious. Okay, we're all still going to do it. It's been so long since I've done it. Let's try again. I am made by God and I'm precious, I'm precious to Him. Great then. <laughs> By the way, you're giving yourself the hug. Yeah. Yeah. Then we are made by God to do what? Love others. Love others. someone remembers. And then, third week, life in a broken world hurts, doesn't it? All our sickness, all our sorrow. Thank you, Helen. Do you want to take a look at that? Um, Jesus knows how we feel because he lived here too. He knows everything as the Son of God, but he also experienced it as Jesus. Then, the fourth week, we thought about our bodies and how we are wonderfully made by God, and our bodies are us, they are God's gift to us. Then, last time we met, thinking about being loved by God and forgiven by God in Jesus. And today, our young people will be learning about how God gives his Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to bring us to life and then change us to be more like Jesus. That was that was that was last week. Oh was it? <laughs> or which case? Today learning what are we learning? Be like Jesus and be with him. Okay. There's been a change of plan since the notes are received, but that's all right. Today we'll be thinking about how God's Spirit. Tell me. I wasn't. Maybe we should just let the children go. Yeah, go on. Go on, children. Go learn. Come back and tell us what you've learned. Let's pray for us all. Father God, we, we thank you that you, you made us. We are precious to you. Our bodies are us. And we might love and look after them. And we, we thank you that you forgive us, that you bring us into relationship with you. We pray as our children here today, they will learn and even become those who teach us as out of the mouth of babes and infants, you ordain praise. Amen. Amen. Off you go, everybody. Turn your Bibles, and those who are staying here, to John chapter 21. I'm going to read the first 14 verses as an introduction to communion, and then we're going to read the last five verses 
before I preach God's word. So John 21. Last week we looked at how Jesus restored Peter after Peter had denied even knowing Jesus. Imagine that maybe some of us here have had a good friend deny knowing us. Maybe we've denied knowing somebody else. We thought about restoration last week, and then we're going to look again this week at true heart and mission. So John 21, afterwards Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the Demas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's Nathaniel and Thomas, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Nobody answered. He said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then a disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. That's important. It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw the fire, I saw a fire of burning coals, there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and drank the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. We're going to break fast, as it were, with Jesus, as he invites us to eat with him at communion. So we're going, to, we're going to go through the communion liturgy, and then we're going to sing the communion song, and then we're going to eat together. So, I'm going to set up the communion. It's just at this point that I realise that I don't have the communion liturgy. What is going on today? Thank you, Helen. Come and have breakfast. about uh, Jesus is how he shows grace. He demonstrated grace to Peter by saying, come and eat with me, come and have breakfast. And so we come to the table this morning as those who hear Jesus calling, come and have breakfast. What we'll do, you'll see, um, you'll see um, the cups are there, so if you're to see um, me, you'll be called by the ushers to come forward one row at a time. Come and receive the bread from me, and then come and fill your glass. And then um, I'd like to stand and wait until everyone's got uh, bread and wine. At that point, I will ask, um, I'll invite you to kneel if you want to kneel at the communion rail. And, um, uh, and if, you, if you aren't able to or rather stand, that's fine. Um, we don't kneel because we're trying to adore the bread and wine because we're being humble before God and it can help us to kneel to show that to, to be humble but we don't need to kneel to be humble so that's how we do communion and um, after communion just leave your glass on the rail or put it back on the table or go back to your seats um, communion I should just remind us is a, a, a family meal for those who have been baptised into the Christian faith 
So we invite all those who are baptized. If you've not been baptized, you can come forward, don't pick up a glass, just ask me and I'll pray a blessing for you. The law. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Do not worship idols or created things. Do not take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and give us the desire to keep these laws. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these your laws in our hearts. Let's examine ourselves. Dearly beloved in the Lord, as we come to the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ, remember that the Apostle Paul exhorts everyone to examine themselves, not eating and drinking as if we are entitled or deserving. If we eat and drink with a truly humble, contrite and broken heart, with living faith in Christ, then He will live in us and we in Him. We'll be in great danger if we receive Holy Communion unworthily, eating and drinking to our own damnation and kindling God's wrath against us. Judge yourselves, dearly beloved, so you're not judged by the Lord. Repent truly for your past sins. Let faith in Christ be alive and firm. Change your lives and live in perfect love with all people. Give heartfelt thanks to God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for his salvation and redemption of the world by the death and passion of Christ. He has given us this meal as a great comfort to us, reminding us of what he won for us on the cross, forgiveness and mercy, by which he calls us to live holy, righteous and peaceful lives for the glory of his name. So you then who, are, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbor, neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from this day forward in his holy ways. Draw near with faith, and take his holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in the newness of life to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just imagine that you are sat there on the beach and Jesus says, come have breakfast. And then remember back in the time when he said, Matthew, 20, Matthew 11, Jesus says to everyone who turns to him, 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right as our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. And therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. And so we pray, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not even worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord who delights in sharing mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the bread and drink this wine, that our bodies and souls may be cleansed by Christ's body and blood, and that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We especially praise you because in your tender mercy, you sent him to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. There he made by his once and for all offered himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and commanded us to continue an ongoing memory of his precious death until he comes again. Through the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. Amen.
together the end of the green sheet almighty and ever living God we thank you for reassuring us of this communion of your favour and goodness towards us that we are truly members of the body of your son and that we are also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom we humbly ask you heavenly father to keep us as faithful members of your church and to strengthen us by your spirit so that we will fulfill those good works which you have prepared for us to do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. What a great Saviour we have. We're going to learn from him now. Uh, Kashmir is going to come and read uh, from four, 14 to 19 of chapter 21. And Faith, reading in English? Can't remember. I think it's Faith. Um, we're going to turn back to John 21 and read the last, sorry, 15 to, 20, 15 to 19. Well, no, it wasn't Faith, it was. Might have been, I've, got, I've got them mixed up. Um, do you want to sort it amongst yourselves to see who wants to read? I'm very happy to have the original plan. Catch a you come and read. It was only because Faye asked me before the service, are you sure we're doing the same reading as last week? And I said, yes, we are. And then I, then I thought maybe Faye was reading, but actually it's Lottie. Lottie, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for my misremembering who was reading this morning. John chapter 21, 
15 to 19. So, Jabu Kate, the Yishu name Simon Patras no Akya, a Simon for Juana the Putter, he to Milu Ilanaru Patipia Katare, Un Usu Akya, half of Uji, to John the head, Jo Matir in all in the Kartaha, Un Unukia, Mere Lelia no Jar, Usne fair Dujivar Unukia, a Simon Juana the Putter, he to Milu Piar Katare. ओन उसने आख्या हां प्रभु जी तू जानता है जो मैं तेरे नाल हित करता हां उसने ओनु कहा मेरिया पे डंडी रशिया का उसने तीजी बार ओनु कहा हे साइमन जोहन्ना दे पुत्र की तू मेरे नाल हित करता है पतरस उदास होया इसलिए जो उसने तीजी बार ओनु कहा की तू मेरे नाल हित करता है अते उसने आख्या प्रभु जी तू ता सब जानी जान है तेनु मालूम है जो मैं तेरे नाल हित करता हां यीशु ने ओनु आख्या मेरिया पे डर जा मैं तेनु सच सच आखदा हां कि जा तू जवान सै ता अपना लक बन के जिथे तेरा जी करता सी तू उथे जांदा सी पर जा तू बूटा होएगा ता अपने हाथ लंबे करेगा ਅਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਤੇਰਾ ਹੋਰ ਲੱਕ ਬੰਨੇਗਾ ਔਰ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਤੇਰਾ ਜੀ ਨਾ ਕਰੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਲੈ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਉਸਨੇ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਆਖੀ ਵੀ ਪਤਾ ਦੇਵੇ ਜੋ ਉਹ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਮੌਤ ਨਾਲ ਪਰਮੇਸ਼ਵਰ ਦੀ ਬੜਿਆਈ ਕਰੇਗਾ ਔਰ ਇਹ ਕਹਿ ਕੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਆਖਿਆ ਹਾਂ ਮੈਂ Chapter 15 verses 15 to 19 page 1090 in the Lord's Bible. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Please. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was cut because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. <coughs> Jesus said, Feed my feet. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went away in the mountain. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you, and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Thank you, Lord, and Christ, We often start our thinking about God's word by having a discussion. So I'm going to try and help us think about this passage by asking a question. We don't need too long to think about it. Just think about your first instinctive reaction to this question. Uh, and then Be aware of your instinctive reaction. We're going to do some discussion later. It's not a discussion question, it's a reflecting question. Do you think that life is better when people are free to do what pleases them or when there are restrictions for people to live for the good of others? Do you think it's better? Life is better when people are free to do what pleases them or when there are restrictions for people to live for the good of others. That's going to take us somewhere towards this passage, um, understanding it in our place today. In the last chapter of John's Gospel, chapter 21, which we looked at last week, Peter has gone back to his life as a fisherman. The leader of his movement has been murdered, crucified, tortured to death, like thousands of criminals and revolutionaries. So Peter chose to go back to what he knew. He chose to be a fisherman. 
an ordinary job in an ordinary place with his ordinary friends. And then the resurrected Jesus appears on the shore, verse 4, and calling Peter, Peter's life was never going to be the same again. When people like you and me meet the resurrected Jesus as he calls us, then our ordinary lives, in ordinary places, with ordinary friends, change from being focused on our own choices to living for Jesus. Look at the last line of our reading. Follow me. Verse 19. Follow me. That means orientate your whole day, every week, to following me. So, um, I printed the order service on Thursday. I'm going to tell you we're going to change all the headers. The structure is the same, but the headers are different. So, who is Jesus that we should love him? is going to change to Jesus is Lord. Love him. Jesus is Lord. Love him. Um, notice in the boat, when they've been fishing, the disciple whom Jesus loved, verse 7, said to Peter, It is the Lord. It is the Lord. And that Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to shore. After breakfast, Jesus invites his friends to eat with him, which we've done this morning. Then he says to Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of John, goes back to his old name, Simon Peter, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Is that question clear to you? No. Last week I thought it was. This week I'm going, this is ambiguous. It's unclear. What does Jesus mean by these? Does he mean these 153 large fish? Because they must be worth quite a lot of money. Does he mean these boats and nets? Does he mean these friends, the other fishermen? Or is it all of these? I think Jesus was asking Peter if he loved Jesus more than anything else. And if I'm right, I might not be at this point in the reading, but we're going to read on. Then Jesus is asking if Peter loves him with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and all his strength. Do you love me more than these? Peter replies, yes, Lord, I love you. Not, yes, Jesus, I love you. Not, yes, Rabbi or teacher, I love you. Not, yes, friend or brother, I love you. But yes, Lord, I love you. What is the first and greatest commandment? To love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus, Lord, love him. Let's see if it builds, because if this might be the wrong reading, it might be right. Jesus then says to Peter, feed my sheep, or feed my lambs, and then feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. Whose sheep is Jesus referring to? It is my sheep, my lambs. And Peter's a man who knows his scriptures. If Peter says, feed my sheep, then Peter goes, well, if these are your sheep, then you must be the shepherd. And if Jesus is the shepherd, which Old Testament readings immediately come to mind? Anybody want to suggest an Old, an Old Testament reading? Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd. Who's my shepherd? The Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Love him. So I think we should read Psalm 23 responsorially. Let's get back to Psalm 23. Because this is where I think Jesus is making a connection in Peter's mind. If you turn to page 555 in 
the blue Bibles. I don't know what the bold print ones are. We haven't read a, a, a psalm responsorially for a while. Responsorially means I read a line and then you read a line together. And we'll break it into the verse, verse numbers, verses 1 to 6. So if I read the odd number verses from 1 to 5, you read the even number verses 2, 4, and 6. So this is, feed my sheep, says Jesus, the Lord's my shepherd. We all find Psalm 23. I will take that as a yes. Let's, let's read it. I'll read the first verse, and you read on the second and on the third so on. So, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Amen. No, I think there are hints of this psalm in the restoration of Peter by the Sea of Tiberias. Um, they're sitting by quiet waters. Peter's soul is restored. He's led on new paths of righteousness. And even he's, he's told how he will die and that he need not fear evil. So many hints, I think, of, of Psalm 23 in John 21. Eating, quiet waters, the talk about death. And there might be more that I've missed. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus, Lord, love him. So when he's saying to Peter, feed my sheep, he's saying, I am the Lord, the good shepherd of Psalm 23. And then Jesus is the shepherd, rather than the work of the shepherd. If you look in the headers, we're on the second one, that Jesus is the shepherd. So Jesus asked Peter to feed his sheep. What does he mean? Well, Peter's now going, oh, that's not clear. Jesus, but again we're going back into the Old Testament. Does anyone know anywhere in the Old Testament where the Lord talks about being the shepherd? Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. Flick back in your Bibles to another Old Testament passage. Remember last week we looked at the um, prophet Jeremiah who said that the second exodus, the freedom from slavery to sin would come through the calling of fishermen. So last week was the beginning of the second Exodus. Now we're in Ezekiel 34, which is page 865 in this Bible, which will be the same in the teal and the blue and the red Bibles, but not the gold print. We're not going to read the whole passage. We're going to point out two verses, um, three verses. So what's happening in Ezekiel is the time of the exile, and Ezekiel's prophesying to the people of Israel from God saying, the problem with Israel is that your shepherds, the, the, the leaders of your nation, are fat, greedy, corrupt, powerful, abusing power people. Look at verse one and two of chapter 34. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the, against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. They are living freely for their own life, their choice, choices for themselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? Anyone in a position of leadership is a shepherd called to care for the flock. And so God then speaks to the people, verses 15 and 16. I myself will tend 
my sheep. What did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. I myself, says the Sovereign Lord, will feed my sheep and make them lie down. Verse 16, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. That should send fear and trembling into any national leader or, or any leader. I will shepherd my flock with justice. And Jesus claims that he is the one who came to tend his sheep. There's only one flock of sheep. It's not that the sovereign Lord has one flock and Jesus has another flock. There's one flock because Jesus is the Lord. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, Lord, love him. Jesus is the shepherd who came to do what? To care for his sheep who are in only five categories. The lost, the strain, the injured, the weak, or the sleek and strong. We're going to come back to the sheep in a minute, but let's just think about Jesus' nature as a human being. He was both the sovereign Lord and he was man. As God, he could save everybody from slavery to sin. He could destroy Satan's power. He could rise from the dead. He could save us from God's judgment. His death as the Son of God was worth the souls of billions of people. As God, he is Savior of the world. But as a man, he is like you and me. He cannot be everywhere. He cannot do everything. As a man, he could not sort out every pastoral problem. He could not visit every sick person. He could not reconcile every broken relationship. And as a man, he could not offer counseling and guidance to everyone. As a man, he could only pastor those he was in contact with day to day. So he started a movement, a body with a defined goal, a clear vision, a global mission. Peter, I know you love me. Go and feed my sheep. But then Peter is a human being who only has enough capacity to do what he can. He can't be everywhere, he can't do everything, he can't pastor everybody, he can't sort out every relationship that's broken or every sick person, he can't offer guidance and counseling to everybody. And so Jesus says to those who come to him, Neil, you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Helen, he says, do you love me? Helen says, yes, I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. As a church family, you have set me and Helen apart to be shepherds, to bring and feed you the word of God. That's my role in life. And I ask you to pray for me for two things. I think it's important at this point in my own life, to keep my love for Jesus alive, to keep that strong, passionate love for him alive. And I can only do that by spending time in prayer and study and meditation upon his word. If I get too busy to love Jesus, I won't be of any use to anybody. I'll only serve out of duty and compassion and tiredness rather than from love. And secondly, I need your prayer to feed you to the best of my God-given ability. I'm not one of the great famous preachers of all time who've been celebrities or even today celebrity culture and the internet. But I want you to pray for me that I will feed you on God's word. You will find rest for your souls. And the same for Helen. Keep her in your prayers too. But all to remember this. You're not my sheep. You're not Helen's sheep. You are Jesus' sheep. You belong to him. You are my sheep, says Jesus. And he loves you and me more than we can ever love each other. He is risen. He's alive. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. He's going to come back one day to judge the world and take his people to be with him. And he's delegated the responsibility of feeding his sheep to his under shepherds. Feed the sheep, says Jesus. We are his sheep. From now on, the life of the sheep on the notes, and we change that header from life of sheep to we are his sheep. There are only five kinds of sheep lost, 
strained, injured, weak, fat and greedy. They're all pretty clear, aren't they? Lost? I don't know where I am. Strayed? I've wandered away from the path. Injured? I have been wounded in my heart and soul. Weak? I don't have the strength to face what's in front of me or on my plate. Fat and greedy, we are the bully boy sheep, we coerce, we threaten, we manipulate and everything to do things for ourselves, to keep things for ourselves. That's the sheep that Ezekiel 34 describes. My sheep, said the Lord. I tell you a little honeymoon story from Amanda and I, 28 years ago, crystal clear. Amanda and I went to County Cork in, in the Republic of Ireland, we went to the Bera Peninsula, one day went for a walk in the countryside, and there on the path, just the length of the path, a little lamb lying in a ditch, bleating. We went for a walk, about three hours came back, the lamb was still there. Well, this lamb's lost, and it's injured, and hungry, and weak. So I picked it up, and I walked up onto the hill, and I could see a flock of sheep, and I walked towards the sheep. All the sheep scattered, except one. That sheep, stood still, as I got close, it started getting a bit nervous. I put the lamb down, I backed off, and the two were reunited, and the lamb went straight to his mother's, uh, to his mother to feed. That's the work of the shepherd. We're like that, we're like that lamb in that ditch. We are weak, lost, strayed, injured, and the good shepherd comes and he reunites us with our heavenly father. We all, like sheep, said the prophet Isaiah, have what? Gone astray. No one's on the right path. No one's in the right place with God. None of us is perfect. We're not the complete, finished article. We are lost, strained, injured, weak, sleep or greedy at any point in our life, any day of the year. None of us are ever in the perfect place. So we're going to come to the last bit. We've acknowledged that Jesus is the Lord, we love him. We've acknowledged that Jesus is the shepherd who's come to shepherd his flock, but as a human being, a divine human being, he can't be everywhere, so he delegates that to his people. His people are his sheep. Any one of us can be lost, strayed, injured, weak, or sleep of at any time. And lastly, we are sheep. But we are to be shepherds as well. I am a vicar, and I am under-shepherd of Jesus. Helen's assistant pastor, under-shepherd of Jesus. There are times where Helen and I will get weak, where we'll get injured, where we might go astray, where we might end up lost, or where I might overstep my authority as your vicar and become sleek and powerful and do things in my own interest. I need to be pastored. I need someone to pastor me. So if you love Jesus and you know Jesus loves you and you are one of his sheep, then you need to hear him saying you need to be pastored. But here's the Christian revolution. The Christian revolution says that you can also be a pastor. You hear Jesus saying, I love you and you Hear Jesus asking, do you love me? And you say, yes, I love you, Lord. He says, well, then feed my sheep. I believe it's a time in history where we are all weaker and more injured and more bruised and battered by our selfish, self-centered, individualistic society. But being a community of people who love each other is the most important thing we can be doing today. Not chasing our bucket lists, lists not trying to fulfill our hopes and dreams and reach for the stars and be the real me, but no. Love Jesus and then love each other by, by pastoring each other. We can't leave it to the vicar and the assistant pastor because we're human beings. We can't be everywhere. We can't do everything. We can't sort every partial situation out. We can't visit every sick person. We can't reconcile a broken relationship. We can't counsel and guide everybody but we can pastor one another. We can gather as a flock to hear God's word. We can feed on that word and then feed each other. We can talk openly, explore, 
and then connect to the Word of God. We can make time for each other, find sit, space to sit and rest by quiet waters, take it easy, then talk, listen, understand, and show compassion, feed each other, link his word to our needs. God's word, his story, gives lost people a sense of place. When we find our place in God's story, our lives make sense, we find ourselves. His word helps us to retell our own stories in light of his. His word gives straying people a light to their feet and a light to their path to bring them back onto the path. His word gives injured people healing. He heals our traumas and our broken hearts. His word gives weak people strength to face the day. His word humbles the powerful. His word, word, word makes selfish people generous. So if you have been injured, hear Jesus calling you. If you have gone astray here calling you, if you have gone somewhere where you're weak or heavy laden, he calls you. And then there's last, this is the last application, three things we should do. Spend time, firstly, drawing close to Jesus, that his word and he himself fills our hearts so much that we pound with love for him. Secondly, admit we are sheep, that we are lost, straying, injured, weak, or even strong and greedy. Admit it, just be honest, this is what I'm like as a sheep. That little sheep in the ditch was bleating. We can bleat. And then ask the shepherd to find us. And then as we do that, we, he says, well, you're to do it for each other, so therefore find someone you trust to sit with and talk things through and pray together and find God's word to bring that restoration of your soul. And thirdly, train to be a better shepherd. There are so many ways just now that we could learn to do this better for me and for you and for Helen. So even this Thursday, come along, learn to pastor people who are suffering with fear and anxiety. Come along. Say, I need to be a better pastor. Teach me how to teach me how to pastor the other sheep. Or we have um, I need to get more of these. We've got resources. Walking with the message of you sufferers. Caring for one another. Biblical counsel, counseling courses. Um, there's another one there, stupid Google Counseling. Little books by the Christian Counseling and Education Foundation. Uh, that one's called The Money Month when the Money Runs Out help and cope for the financially stressed. All sorts of ways we can develop our pastoral skills for each other in place of our current social culture of chasing our bucket lists and dreams. Go to the ACCEF website where you'll find podcasts on things like When You Cannot Sleep or How Grief Is Worship or Dealing With Seasonal Depression. The list goes on and on. The BC UK website has audios from conferences on all kinds of subjects. We can learn to be better pastors. Jesus is the Lord. Love him. Really love him. Jesus is the shepherd. He came to care for his sheep. He's delegated that to his under shepherds. We are his sheep in need of constant shepherding. But sheep become shepherds. So never stop being sheep. Learn to be a pastor. I skipped a question. You can choose which of these two questions you'd like to discuss with each other. First question is this, what kind of sheep are you just now? What kind of sheep are you just now? Find someone you really trust and say to them, do you know what, right now I'm, I'm lost or injured or weak or struggling or injured. Maybe I'm just being a bully. And if you, want to, if you want to not discuss that, discuss this instead. How about discussing what could you do over the next few months to become a better shepherd? Have a little chat amongst yourselves and then we'll see.
Right. If, if you were anything like me in that conversation, I would be moved to pray. If you want to spend a moment, just pray for the person next to you, just briefly. And if there's any conversation started, then carry it on after. So it finishes. Be interesting to reflect on whether you spoke on the first question about what kind of sheep you are, or the second question, what how to become a better pastor. Um, if you didn't, if you focus on one or the other, then maybe in your own time ask the question that you didn't answer in the discussion. Shall we sing a happy song? Yes. The Lord is. My shepherd, Psalm 23, Stuart Pennant version. Um, let's stand and sing. It's uh, just judge. I think it's probably not an instrument song, but just judge for yourselves and, and, and see what you think. Let's sing. The Lord's my shepherd. Yeah. 
Spirit and in, un and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. <coughs> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Father, 
There is so much going on in the world. There are tribulations of all kinds. We are witnessing political upheaval, unrest, poverty, hunger, abuse of all kinds, wars, nation against nation, brother against brother. Father, we pray for peace, softening of hearts, willingness to share for compassion and for compassion for each other. There are so many places where your people are being persecuted, so many people who have to flee, leaving behind family and friends, their anguish and sorrow for them, Father. Father, hear their prayers for safety and peace. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, I pray for your church here in England and throughout the world. I pray that you help and give your people strength to endure persecution, some of which is from within the church. I pray for the bishops and archbishops to live and teach according to your word and not deviate from it, not to add or take away from it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, I pray for King Charles and the up upcoming coronation. Lord, let his reign be according to your laws. Let him uphold your glory and let him always turn to you for strength and guidance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, I pray for Remy, the child that we sponsor through compassion. His latest letter is asking for prayers to help him with his exams. Father, this child is learning about you. Let him always live in your faith, uh, live in faith to you. I pray for people in his country that parents and children can grow knowing peace that can only come from you. Let Remy's faith be so strong that he will become a leader in your family and that families will grow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. <coughs> Father, I pray for those who are sick and grieving. I pray for our family here, that their worries and concerns, whether it be physical illness or worries for their loved ones. Father, please hear what our hearts are saying. Give us peace. Give us the peace that we know that without your forgiveness, Father, please hear what we what our hearts are saying. Give us peace because we know without your love, your forgiveness, your mercy and grace, we are lost. Let us take a moment to remember those who are in your hearts so that we can pray for them together. I pray for our brothers and sisters in churches around us that we can still that we can all pull together to share your good news to all. I pray for the doctors, nurses, carers, family and friends who care for each other. Bless them, Father, give them strength and comfort. I pray for mercy and grace for when we struggle to love friends and neighbours, help us to forgive as you first forgave us. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now pray the, pray the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, sister. Well, I've got a few notices. Uh, you'll notice they've over two pages. I'm not going to look at all of them in any detail, 
Um, but I do want to say that the first one is very important. A living local <laughs> church. Um, your PCC has written a statement, and many of you are given copies of that statement in its draft form. Uh, the good news is, it was obviously so well written that we got no um, comments back that we thought we needed to change anything. So the, the statement will go onto our church website tomorrow. And I want to tell you why it's important, uh, the reasons behind why I wrote this statement. Um, as you'll know, the bishops of the Church of England have proposed introducing um, prayers of blessing for same-sex couples. And that's um, caused lots of pain and confusion, not just in the Church of England, but across the whole world. And, um, and even this week, the 85% of the global Anglicans who live in Africa, Asia, and Southern America have, um, have said that because of Justin Welby's direction of the Church of England, they will no longer follow him as the Archbishop of Canterbury and the, what they call the first amongst equals of the Church in the Anglican Communion. And so the, the rest of the world is having its own structures of communion and uh, leaving us in England, except for the faithful parishes that seek to continue to uphold God's teaching in this area. So our statement does that, and it would therefore mean that anyone who asks you what we believe here about being a church, you could point them to that statement on the website and say, I, I haven't memorized it all, we might memorize it all, but you want to say, can you read that and discuss it with me? And also why people who are looking for a church to know what we believe before they come, which will avoid potential conflict. So this is up tomorrow. We put pray for us. Um, because in our current climate, the fact that we say that we uphold the marriage of a man and a woman and uphold the honour uh, honor of singleness and celibacy uh, might invite um, hostility from people who are campaigning for other ways of understanding relationships. The other events I want to draw your attention to, um, we're proposing, Helen's proposing, I want to support this, um, that we expand our ability to do assemblies in school. We're talking to school about this possibility. If you think you could do a storytelling assembly as part of a team, please see Helen if you would like to know more about what that involves or open the book. Our open church starts as Wednesday. Um, please be praying for us. We had the last two before Easter. There were 38 and 40 children came along to those two and we are um, having to do a lot of work to make that um, session something that's beneficial for all who come. And so we're praying for volunteers, pray for Marlene, pray for me, uh, and just ask if we can get, make sure we get the right number of things in place that, that everyone who comes is looked after. The um, Annual Political Church meeting will be held three weeks today. Last Sunday, uh, sorry, this is the last Sunday for you to get your name onto electoral roll. If you are baptized and qualify, you will then have um, the ability to serve the church by voting or standing for election. So if you've not been asked to be on electoral roll yet and you are baptized, uh, then please see me or mark off the service. There are some dates coming up for the future. Um, future Keep in mind, actually, the Midlands Men's Convention is coming very quickly. Um, if you want to avoid disappointment, please see Tim today, he'll book a ticket for you. And then um, look at the rest of the dates there. Um, Jason and Tracy Day, who are mission partners in Thailand, are coming to an evening session, an evening meeting on the 9th of July, claim to be confirmed. And so um, do keep that date available. Come and support them in prayer. Great, let's pray again. We're going to pray the prayer of general thanksgiving to God uh, for all his generosity to us. The children are coming at right at the time. We're going to pray with them. Then we're going to sing. Then we're going to receive God's blessing. And then we're going to eat. Um, you're invited to stay for refreshments. And if you've got time, stay for lunch, which will be about one o'clock. We're going to pray the prayer of general thanksgiving. So you're just in time. <laughs> everyone can get their eyes on a, on a prayer sheet on an order of service, the white one, not the green one. We're going to pray the prayer of the Thanksgiving. 
We, we are, as Christians, we know the goodness of God and the generosity of God. He calls us to be generous people uh, who give time, money, love, energy, possessions in different ways every day. So let's give thanks to God for his generosity to us and commit ourselves to being generous people. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unprofitable servants, give you most humble and heartfelt thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be totally thankful and that we may praise your name, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves and our possessions to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we thought today about, um, as, in, as followers of Jesus, when Jesus come follow me, he invites us to a lifetime of learning. And as we learn to be better shepherds to one another, uh, as we learn to love one another like Jesus loves us, then our last song is a kind of prayer. It is a prayer to ask God to teach us to dance to the beat of his heart of compassion. So pick up your instruments, make a loud noise, we're going to sing and teach me to dance.
standing to receive God's blessing. You pick up your order of service. May the Father, who so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, bring us by faith to his eternal life. Amen. May Christ, who accepted the cup of sacrifice, in obedience to the Father's will, keep us steadfast as we walk with him the way of the cross. Amen. And may the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, that we may share his glory, set our minds on life and peace. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.